is how this letter sounded in antiquity. Known as Y in English, Y in modern Greek and Italian, in Latin it's pronounced HU, the same name it has in ancient Greek. But how do we know that this letter was pronounced differently in ancient times? Let's find out together. I'm Luke and this is Polymathy, or Polymathy, or Polumathu. This video continues the series on the changing phonology of Greek from antiquity to the present. If you haven't seen these videos yet, then definitely check them out after you see this one. Some of my sources include Greek, A History of the Language and its Speakers by Horrocks, Medieval and Early Modern Greek by Holton, Horrocks, et al., Vox Graica and Vox Latina by Allen, The Pronunciation of Greek and Latin by Sturdivant, and in the description you'll find links to these books on Amazon in case you're interested. Also worthy of consultation, Threet, The Grammar of Attic Inscriptions, and Gignac, A Grammar of the Greek Papyri of the Roman and Byzantine Periods. As always when answering these questions, it's worth looking at Modern Greek, a language descended directly from Ancient Greek. In Modern Greek, the letter, that in English is called Upsilon or Upsilon or Upsilon, is pronounced the same as the letter Iota or Iota in Modern Greek. Both are pronounced I. In fact, all these letters and digraphs make the same sound in Modern Greek. I. In English, their names are Iota, Eta, Upsilon, and the digraphs Epsilon Iota, Omicron Iota, and Upsilon Iota. The modern Greek names for all of these are Iota, Ita, Ypsilon, Epsilon Iota, Omicron Iota, Ypsilon Iota. Due to the fact that alphabetic writing systems are largely rational when first employed, modern Greek speakers need to look no further than this string of differently spelled but identical sounding characters to realize that the pronunciation of modern Greek is quite different from that of ancient Greek. All these had different values in the classical Attic of 403 BC, when the Ionic alphabet was adopted by the Athenians. Their merger into the same vowel sound is known as Ioticism or Eticism, since they all sound like the letter Iota, Jota, or Eta, Ita. But how long ago was it that the Upsilon letter merged into the other E sounds? The original value of Upsilon was the same as, of course, the letter U in Latin, U. This is quite plain from cognates in other Indo-European languages. Proto-Indo-European dumos gives us Sanskrit duma, Latin fulmus, and in a very archaic pronunciation, the ancient Greek tumos, which later becomes tumos in classical Greek. This u value is retained in classical Greek diphthongs alpha, upsilon, au, and epsilon, upsilon, eu, which were pronounced au and eu, and this was their dominant pronunciation in the Koine period, which is made manifestly clear to us thanks to the countless Latin transcriptions of Greek loans with au and eu, such as aula from aule and euboia from euboia. It's only during the Roman classical period that we observe au and eu start to shift to av, ev, and eventually av, ev in isolated areas until the latter becomes the dominant pronunciation by medieval times. For more, see the Phi Theta Chi video, and for much more, see the detailed phonological history and pronunciation guide in my new audiobook, Judgment of the Goddesses. But Upsilon didn't stay U. By the 6th century BC, it had been fronted towards U, as in the French Lune, or German Zeus. See my IPA vowel video for how to pronounce this close front rounded vowel, U. The trick, of course, is to say E, but round your lips. And we know that this is the right pronunciation for classical Greek thanks to spellings like space for Old Persian wishtaspa. The initial ui is represented by u, and this interchange of ui and u is extremely common also with Latin inscriptions and Greek. For example, kyriake spelled like this in Latin, and kyriites spelled like this in Greek. Horrocks proposes that the fronting of Upsilon was caused by the monophthongization of Epsilon Iota into E and Omicron Upsilon into U. It's worth repeating often that Epsilon Iota does not represent a diphthong, E, in classical or Koine Greek. It is a monophthong, E, in classical Attic and E, by the time of Koine of classical Rome. See my Epsilon Iota video for more. Similarly, Omicron Upsilon doesn't represent a diphthong in Classical Greek either. In the 6th century BC, it was U, which crowded the back axis, 
and encourage the upsilon to be fronted in order to give more space to the far shorter back axis. Then the o raises to u by later classical Attic period. When the Boeotians adopted the Attic Ionic alphabet and its values in 350 BC, the upsilon letter was unsuitable for their u vowels. So they wrote, for example, what an Attic is butiu as butio. Boeotian underwent certain sound shifts that were similar to later general shifts in Koine centuries later, such as the monophthongization of Omicron iota, oi, into ö, and later i. Thus the Boeotians used the Attic Ionic Upsilon, where Attic has Omicron iota. For example, Dusalus proxenus for Doisalus proxenus in contemporary Koine. This, of course, makes it perfectly clear that the pronunciation of koine retains oi, a diphthongal pronunciation of omicron iota, for some time after the classical period. Now, if you want to master the basics of ancient Greek, you're going to want to check out the Ancient Language Institute, this video sponsor. ALI uses a flipped classroom model, where expert teachers of Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and even Old English will guide you in how to read and even think in the language you aim to master. Your instructors at ALI make the most of time in class, troubleshooting difficult passages and concepts, and guiding you to conversational ability and reading fluency. Registration for summer term closes April 15th, with beginner level cohorts starting this summer in Latin, Ancient Greek, and Old English. Additionally, ALI offers a wide variety of intermediate and advanced classes in Anglo-Saxon, Latin, and Greek. And speaking of Greek, join ALI instructors this summer in Eugene, Oregon, for a 10-day Greek language immersion Bible camp. For more information, visit ancientlanguage.com. The quality of upsilon as u is further confirmed by the Roman authors, like Cicero and Quintilian, who say that the upsilon letter in Greek and the letter borrowed to spell Greek words in Latin has no equivalent in native Latin phonology. It is often described as being between u and e, which is appropriate for a closed front rounded vowel. Latin authors originally borrow upsilon as a simple u in Latin, such as burrus for pyrrhus. But the changing phonology of Greek generally, and the better understanding of its standard Attic Koine dialect by the Romans, leads to the importation of the upsilon letter as Roman letter Y. Thus earlier borrowings, such as gubernetes, pilot or sea captain, are rendered as gubernator. Thus the English words government and cybernetics are doublets, having the same Greek origin, with the former representing the pre-classical Latin pattern, and the latter the standard Latinate borrowing. Native Latin speakers with no training in Greek would naturally be unable to produce u, and thus regularly pronounce it as u or e, depending on how fronted the Greek equivalent was at the time, or how their Roman ears perceived it. Naturally, Koine Greek's omicron upsilon, u, was always transcribed as a letter U in Latin. The diphthong Omicron iota underwent monophthongization in Boeotia, U, and eventually U, while Great Attic in Koine retained the diphthong Oi. Eventually, though, first in isolated areas, then more generally by late Koine, the diphthong Oi monophthongized into U and then U, confirmed by spelling errors of the type Dus for Dois. Upsilon and Omicron iota as U was the dominant medieval or Byzantine Greek pronunciation. Byzantine Greek regularly confuses Upsilon and Omicron iota, and it also confuses iota, eta, and epsilon iota, but not Upsilon or Omicron iota for that latter group of E vowels, showing that Upsilon and Omicron iota remain U in this period. This is where the name Ypsilon comes from. Ypsilon in a more archaic pronunciation, but without the aspiration and without the phonemic vowel length, Ypsilon. In ancient Greek and Latin, its name was merely Hu, since there was no confusion with Omicron iota. And a note out there for you English speakers who say He instead of He, see the Phi Theta Chi video for this. I say He and I say Hu, but you may be inclined to say Hu or He. Now, in English, he, if that's your pronunciation for he, that's just fine. But in this case, we want to make sure we say he and not he. You may have noticed that initial upsilon always starts with the H sound, the aspirate, huh, 
So it's always who and not simply u when initial. This seems to have been caused by a number of complicated and interrelated phenomena. For example, the loss of an initial s from Proto-Hellenic or Proto-Indo-European that became the h sound, and something like this or other phenomena were then generalized to the initial upsilon letter wherever it occurred. Once Omicron iota became u, it was a monophthongal digraph and not a true diphthong anymore. That is, a complex way of writing the sound of u. The simple or bare way of writing this sound, u, was with the letter upsilon, hence upsilon, simple u. Interestingly, Horrocks, for all his wonderfully detailed discourse, makes a gross oversimplification. Writing on page 162 of his Greek history, eventually u, represented by upsilon, omicron iota, Upsilon iota, lost its lip rounding to merge once again with E, though the completion of this last shift belongs to the Middle Byzantine period. But that's not the case, not exactly. While the unrounding may have been a general phenomenon in the majority of Byzantine Greek by the 11th century, in a book that Horrocks later co-wrote with Holton in 2019, we have direct testimony from Greek linguists in the 19th century who write about the peculiarities of the Athenian dialect. Και σήμερον το γράμμα Y γενικότατα ως το Ι προφέρεται, κυρίως ύστερα, υπερβολή και τα λοιπά. Ενιαχού δε και ως Ι γερμανιστή, παραδείγματος χάριν, παρετισνήν Αθηναίης, τσουρά αντί κυρά, κυρία. Thanks to Rogelio Toledo for pointing this out to me. Do subscribe to Rogelio and Jenny's stupendous ancient Greek channel Triodos Trivium. Also fascinating is that this U sound in certain medieval or modern dialects actually regressed back into U. That is, the formerly closed front rounded vowel was backed into a closed back rounded vowel again. Modern Siconian, for example, has Jugo from ancient Zygos or Zygos, which is Zygos in Standard Modern Greek. Siconian also has Schulos, next to Standard Modern Greek Skilos. Because of the regular palatalization of these consonants before front vowels, we know that examples such as these demonstrate that the vowel in these dialects used to be u, but then was backed again into u. There exists evidence that some modern Greek dialects that have u for upsilon may actually have retained that sound from deep antiquity. For more on that, see Holton and Allen. In various Western European languages, the letter Y was associated with Latin words where it was retained orthographically, but pronounced the same as letter I, so just E for most of these Western European languages. Thus, it is retained in certain Latinate borrowings into French and English, and usually equivalent to the same sound or sounds that the letter I can produce. This is also why Y has come to be used for the Y consonant sound in English since it was largely interchangeable with the letter I, which also was used for a Y sound for centuries. So that's the story of why Y changed, fronting and unrounding and merging from pre-classical through Koine and Byzantine to modern times. Thanks again to Ancient Language Institute, and thanks as always to each and every one of my Patreon supporters. Walete, kai, bukiainete.